So, um, welcome everybody um, to uh, the second day of this uh, mini conference on white dwarfs. And this morning session is about uh, binaries, uh, white dwarfs and binaries. We have three talks. Uh, the first uh, one is a shared talk by Stephen Parsons and Anna Pala. Then we have a 20 minute talk by Diogo Belloni. And then we have another sh shared talk at the end, and after each talk, uh, which in total will be 20 minutes, we have 10 minutes of discussion time. Um, uh, in the chat, you find the code of conduct and uh, the Slack. So in case there is not enough time for everybody to ask his or her questions, um, then just use the Slack and the link is in the chat. Um, I think that's it for now. So I hope uh, Stephen manages with his iPad. He had a little bit of problems, uh, as you realized. Um, so we have the first talk by Stephen and Anna, and this is about post common envelope binaries and then down to the CVs, uh, kind of a review of recent results and their results. So Stephen, just uh, take it away. Um, right, okay, so uh, as Matthias said, um, we're splitting this between myself and Anna. Um, I'm going to take the, um, the kind of the detached systems and then Anna will take over halfway through to talk about the cataclysmic variable systems. Um, now, since I only have 10 minutes, uh, get straight into it. Um, so let's start off here um, with a brief introduction about uh, common envelope evolution here. Um, so so what I'm going to be talking about most here is white dwarfs in close binaries with low mass stars, so M dwarfs, um, in which case we're talking about binaries that originally had very significant uh, mass ratios. Right. So I've noticed here, you know, uh, I've put greater than about 3.2. I and mean, this isn't a kind of hard and fast number. Um, but essentially, it, these extreme mass ratios mean that when the primary star, so the more massive one, eventually evolves off the main sequence and fills its Roche lobe uh, as a giant, this mass transfer will always be dynamically unstable. So we're always going to get a common envelope event. You know, there's no chance of any kind of stable mass transfer um, at these kind of extreme mass ratios. Um, and so we're talking about binaries here that had an original separation of a few astronomical units at most, right? Um, so they were close enough that when the the primary was a giant, it, it did fill its Roche lobe at some point. Uh, and of course, the thing is that uh, once the primary fills its Roche lobe and this common envelope event occurs, um, we believe that this uh, event is extremely rapid, right? probably around a thousand years, perhaps even quite a lot less than that. Um, and during that event, the, the entire outer envelope of the primary star is lost. And so what that is doing is effectively terminating the evolution of the primary star, right? Cutting it off at an exact point in its evolution. Um, and what I'll show later on is that um, the effects of that can be seen in the distribution uh, of the, the parameters of these uh, binaries and the white dwarfs, um, et cetera, right? It, this is imprinted into the population. Um, and of course, this envelope is expelled uh, using energy from the orbit of the original binary, right? So the, the orbital energy is transferred into the envelope and is used to eject it. And so, of course, if we're expelling and uh, if we're taking energy away from the orbit, then that means this binary is going to emerge from the common envelope at much shorter periods than it uh, entered it at. Um, and as I said, when we're talking about these kind of extreme mass ratios, then we are talking about here white dwarfs with uh, low mass M dwarf companions. Um, and so when we look at these systems, uh, we actually find that uh, they're, they're a really perfect population of systems for, for studying. Um, for starters, we now know huge numbers of these things. So uh, Alberto's um, latest catalog has kind of thousands of these things in there. Um, and you can see that they're really easy to identify from an optical spectrum. Um, you see features from both stars. So these are double lined binaries very often. Um, and it also allows you to get a kind of basic idea of their parameters just from fitting models to the uh, optical spectra. Um, and of course, these are detached systems, so we don't have to worry about any mess because of accretion and all these kind of uh, nasty effects. Um, and here I've got a, uh, a little 
HR diagram there from um, Gaia showing where these things sit. Obviously, if you combine a white dwarf and an M dwarf, these things are going to sit between the white dwarf and M dwarfs, obviously. Um, although they can kind of sit up above, especially when you have very cool white dwarfs. Um, you know, the, the most extreme cases, the white dwarfs can almost be the same temperature as an M dwarf. Um, yeah, OK, good. Um, so uh, one, one nice thing about uh, this population is so large. Um, I have one problem is that if you just see a spectrum of a white dwarf with uh, an M dwarf there, such as the ones in the top corner, um, you don't necessarily know if this is something that's gone through common envelope evolution or if it just happens to be um, a wide binary that has never interacted or even just a chance alignment on the sky. Um, so obviously the, the early work was um, uh, you know, about trying to find the, uh, the ones that are radial velocity variable in the sample. Um, but since we're talking about here radio velocity amplitudes of hundreds of kilometers a second, it's not too tricky to uh, identify the close ones. Um, and so obviously the, one of the easy things you can pull out of this sample is what is the distribution of white dwarf masses, for example, right? So uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, the common envelope is expected to terminate the evolution of the giant star. So we would actually expect the white dwarf masses to be kind of systematically lower than uh, isolated white dwarfs. Um, and the nice thing here is you can use these system, these wider systems as a kind of control sample to um, compare the post common envelope systems to. And that's exactly what was done here in this um, uh, study on the left. So the, the, the black histogram on the far left side here is the, uh, the white dwarf mass distribution for the, um, the, the so-called wide systems, right? So that they're effectively single white dwarfs. And then you compare that to black histogram on the right hand side and you can see that the post common envelope systems are systematically moved to lower masses, which is, you know, it's exactly what we expected. And there had been some uh, hints of this in earlier work with uh, double white dwarfs, et cetera. But the, here is an example of the impact of the common envelope on an entire population of systems. Um, and you can see there are plenty of uh, white dwarfs here with quite low masses, you know, below half a solar mass where we expect the cores uh, to be composed of helium, right? Um, and here they're on the right hand side. This is a, a study I did with eclipsing systems where you can actually measure the mass and radius of the white dwarf independent. Uh, so you can compare that to theoretical models and you can see that the, the measured radii are far too uh, large compared to carbon oxygen models, but uh, bang on the helium core models. So this is actually kind of direct evidence that that the common envelope is leading to the creation of these helium core models, right? These, these points here below half of solar mass, those stars never got a chance to get to the AGB. Um, of course, the other result, as I said, of common envelope evolution is that you're really shrinking down the orbits of these systems. Um, but the way in which it's done is you take this energy from the orbit and you convert it into kinetic energy of the common envelope to kick it away. Um, but that is done with some kind of efficiency, right? You could do it very efficiently, in which case you'd uh, transfer the orbital energy uh, into a lot of kinetic energy and you'd kick out the envelope very quickly. And so your binary wouldn't actually spiral in very much. Or you could do it the other way around, where actually it's very inefficient and you have to pump in lots and lots of orbital energy in order to kick out the envelope. Um, and that is actually what's found with this uh, population of systems. Right? In general, the the uh, common envelope efficiency parameter, this alpha parameter as it's uh, known, seems to be quite low for these systems, about kind of 0.2 to 0.3. Um, and that's reflected in the orbital period distribution of these systems, right? They peak at very short periods. Uh, you know, we're talking a few hours here, right? Everything is brought in very, very close. Um, and you see here the, the top line on this um, plot uh, shows the kind of the detection probability. And so you can see that, uh, that we have very few systems with periods longer than a week or so, but we do actually have the uh, ability to detect them. So the fact that we haven't found them means they genuinely don't exist. Right? All of these systems are brought in very close. Um, now that's kind of looking back in time at these systems, but of course these systems aren't static. They're evolving towards cataclysmic variables. Um, and so uh, the way they do this, they're losing angular momentum, they're spiraling in closer. Um, and kind of one of the big predictions of uh, cataclysmic variable evolution um, is that we have this model called disrupted magnetic breaking, um, where the uh, main sequence stars are losing angular momentum. But if they have a mass below around uh, 0.2 to 0.3 solar masses, 
then uh, they don't um, suffer from magnetic breaking or at least it's uh, strongly depleted. Um, and that is actually um, also seen in this population of detached systems where you notice that uh, systems with very low mass secondaries are more common than higher mass secondaries simply because the higher mass secondaries are experiencing enhanced angular momentum loss and so they're spending a lot less time as detached systems and they're evolving through this phase very fast and becoming CVs and dropping out of this sample. Um, and at the same time, we know that uh, CVs are, are, with the same mechanism are supposed to detach at some point um, when effectively when this magnetic breaking switches off between about two to three hours and they enter the so-called period gap. Um, and when they do this, they will effectively become detached systems and look exactly like the rest of the sample. Uh, and Monica uh, Zorotovic showed a few years ago that you can actually see these systems in the sample of detached systems. Uh, and of course, they, you can also use these systems to study a whole bunch of other um, kind of stellar physics, right? So here on the right hand side, I used it to test the mass radius relation for low mass stars. Um, you can do things like the age activity relation, age metallicity relation, a whole bunch of other things I just don't have the time to go into here at all. Um, but this is just kind of proving that these really are kind of ideal laboratories for studying a whole bunch of different uh, stellar physics. Uh, and then finally, the last part of my uh, section here, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, everything I've shown so far is just uh, taking into account white dwarfs with these low mass M dwarf companions. Um, and if you want to go up to higher masses, obviously things get a little trickier to actually find these things. Right? Because when you have something like an FGK star, um, then it's going to totally dominate in the optical and you're not going to be able to see the white dwarf at all. And so you have to do things like move to the ultraviolet um, as we've started to do here. And what we're beginning to find is that there's a population of systems at these kind of masses that um, have appeared to have gone undergone very similar evolution to the M dwarf ones. And so, you know, normal common envelope evolution. But there's also a population of much, much longer period systems that could have undergone uh, either a different kind of common envelope or maybe stable non-conservative mass transfer, et cetera. And then, of course, you've got other kind of weirdo systems, things like ELCVNs, et cetera, that are kind of uh, not so much contaminating, but adding different channels. And so things get a lot more complicated at higher masses. Um, and so this is kind of very much in the early stages here, but hopefully we can kind of develop these higher mass systems as well in the next few years. Uh, and so then I uh, just finish off my section there by kind of leaving up a few links to some uh, one of the most well-known catalogs there for people who are interested in this stuff. Um, and that's it from me, really. So uh, with that, I'll hand over to Anna. Um, yeah, thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, in this second part of the talk, instead, uh, I will focus on those binaries that uh, evolved in a semi-detached configuration, and uh, I will focus uh, on those that are known as cataclysmic variables, uh, which consists in a white dwarf accreting from a, a lay-type uh, um, sequence star uh, through Roche-Lobe overflow and with the formation typically of uh, an accretion disk. And these binaries have orbital periods between 80 minutes up to two days. Uh, and uh, connecting into a wider picture, uh, these binaries are also important because we know thousands of them, they are nearby, they are bright, and uh, we can uh, directly observe both stellar components, and we can measure their physical parameters. Uh, and therefore, CVs are one of the best laboratories that we have to, um, to, to constrain our understanding of the evolution of all kinds of compact uh, interacting binaries. And that's the reason why we should really try to gather an understanding of their evolution that is uh, as complete as possible. And uh, from the theoretical point of view, Stephen already uh, mentioned something about the evolution of binaries, which uh, is driven by orbital uh, angular momentum losses. Uh, in the case of CVs, with uh, magnetic wind bracking and gravitational wave uh, radiation. Uh, and uh, uh, this orbital angular momentum losses continuously shrink the system, keep the secondary uh, the donor star in touch with its Roche lobe, and set the mass accretion rate uh, onto the white dwarf. And so we can visualize the evolution of these binaries if we if we have a look how the uh, the mass accretion rate varies as a function of the uh, orbital period. 
Uh, and as the system shrinks, it, it moves from long to short orbital periods. And uh, in this period range, above the period gap that uh, Stephen already mentioned, we have the evolution is driven by both magnetic wind tracking and gravitational wave radiation. While once uh, the companion star becomes fully convective and cannot sustain a magnetic wind anymore, the evolution is driven only by gravitational wave radiation. So this is really in a, in a nutshell how the evolution of the system works. Uh, but what I would like to discuss, it's a, a still open question in the evolutionary models uh, of this system, and particularly the problem related to the mass of the white dwarf, and so the, the response of the white dwarf to the mass transfer uh, process. In fact, in this work from uh, from Zorotovich in 2011, uh, it has been shown that CV white dwarf are more massive than both the detached progenitors, which uh, that Stephen told us about, and also uh, than a single white dwarf. And of course, uh, this uh, ring a bell and raise the question whether there is mass growth uh, ongoing uh, in this uh, white dwarf, which is uh, relevant in the context uh, of their potential as type 1a supernova uh, progenitors. However, we don't have an answer yet to this question because there is in CVs, we also have the periodic occurrence of classical nova eruption, which consists in the thermonuclear ignition of the material accreted at the white dwarf surface, which then gets uh, ejected in the surrounding space. And it's not clear yet uh, whether this phenomena will prevent the mass growth or will, in certain conditions, allow uh, the mass uh, to, to retain part of the accreted material. Uh, and also there are alternative scenarios uh, because we also have uh, alternative explanation which do not require uh, invoking mass growth. And for example, the, there are these uh, prescription which have been uh, introduced a few years ago, both by uh, Matthias, but also by Nelemans et al. Uh, and the idea is that uh, CVs hosting low mass white dwarf are dynamically unstable. And in particular, in this talk, I will refer to the ECAM prescription so that there is a consequential angular momentum loss, which um, arises from the mass process itself. Uh, and it's more efficient the lower is the mass of the white dwarf. So in this system, the white dwarf would merge with its companion star, will become a single object and disappear from the population. And so you have that very few systems survive in this mass range, and in this way you can naturally explain uh, the mass distribution of cities. So mm, this uh, nice model that seems to, uh, to give a nice explanation uh, on the observed mass distribution. Uh, but we should also consider that what we know about the mass distribution is based on a relatively small sample of objects, only 41, and uh, whose masses have been measured mainly uh, with one method, so from the analysis of the eclipse light curve. And it's difficult, therefore, to assess whether systematics are playing a major role here. Uh, and so what we should do is both increase uh, the size of the sample and diversify the method used to measure these masses. In this way, uh, we can better constrain the uh, mass distribution and test uh, the current evolutionary models uh, of CVs. Uh, so with this goal in mind, uh, we analyzed 43 CV white dwarf for which we have ultraviolet uh, spectra obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, the ultraviolet is the best wave range in which we can study this system because they are hotter uh, than 10,000 K. So the white dwarf uh, is hotter than 10,000 K and their emission peaks uh, in uh, the ultraviolet. And here you have two sample spectra and you can recognize the presence of um, uh, of the white dwarf photosphere from this uh, from the Lyman alpha uh, absorption. Uh, and also in this wave range, we have uh, wave range. We have very little contamination from the donor and also from the accretion flow, which you can recognize from these strong uh, emission uh, features. And so the idea is that we can perform spectroscopic, spectroscopic fit with synthetic atmosphere model, and we can uh, derive the parameters of the white dwarf. Uh, however, we, there is an additional layer of difficulties here because uh, we know that the temperature and the surface gravity correlates. So higher uh, surface gravity will, will lead to pressure broadening of the lines, which can be counterbalanced by higher temperatures, uh, which implies higher fraction of ionized hydrogen and therefore uh, counterbalance the effect of uh, 
uh, a higher surface gravity. So you can see it becomes uh, virtually impossible to, to distinguish which one is the best fitting model. And therefore, we need an additional uh, constraint. And nowadays, we do have this additional constraint, which is the distance to the system. So we now have Gaia, which provided us um, parallaxes for more than uh, 1 billion stars in the Milky Way. So we combine the analysis of this ultraviolet spectra with the Gaia parallaxes. And assuming a mass radius relationship, we were able to measure both the white dwarf mass and the effective temperature uh, of the white dwarf. And uh, we can now have a look how the mass distribution of CV white dwarf looks in comparison with the result by Zerotovich et al. And we can see that the average mass is still there. It's about 0 0.8. So we can confirm that systematics were not playing a role and the CV white dwarf are massive. And uh, moreover, we also unveil this tail of objects at low masses, which are helium core uh, white dwarfs. Uh, which were not identified before and before, before were not uh, included in, in, uh, in population models. So mm, since we are finding that now, the models should also be revised in order to account for the presence of these systems. And also, if we combine our results with those from the literature, we can build a large sample of CV uh, with accurate uh, white dwarf mass measurement, which is 84 uh, system. And we can have a look for uh, evolution of the mass as a function of the orbital period, because if you remember, the system evolved from long to short orbital period. So if there is any mass evolution, we would see that in their distribution. Uh, but what we find is actually that the average mass for long and short orbital period are very similar. So we do not find any evidence for this mass evolution, which is also consistent with the, the result by McAllister et al. in 2019. But um, what is most interesting is that now that we have effective temperature and masses, we also have uh, all the tools to constrain the evolutionary models because the white dwarf effective temperature reflect the mass accretion rate uh, onto the white dwarf because it's set by the compressional heating of the accreted material. Uh, so we have this uh, relation and we know the effective temperature, we know the mass of the white dwarf, we can derive the observational mass accretion rate and we can compare them with the theoretical prediction. And this is how the effective temperature we measured and the mass accretion rate we measure, color coded as function of the mass of the white dwarf, looks like in comparison with the standard model in which we have only magnetic wind bracking and gravitational wave radiation. And here you can see that the model systematically underestimate the effective temperature. And so this model are indeed missing an additional ingredient which uh, increases the mass loss in the system and makes the white dwarf hotter. And from our result, we can also see that these additional ing uh, ingredients um, uh, must be more efficient the lower is the mass of the white dwarf. So from this result, we, we can see that uh, we, we find observational support from the idea behind the ECA model that uh, I told you about at the beginning. And this is the comparison between uh, our observation and the prediction from ECAM from Belloni et al. in 2020. And you see now we have a better agreement between theory and uh, observation. However, uh, uh, the observed eff effective temperature are more clustered and the mass accretion rate are more scattered uh, than uh, the theory. And we can see this better if we break down this distribution in different mass bin. And this uh, is just telling us that ECAM is going in the right direction. It's uh, uh, including in the model the additional source of angular momentum loss that we are missing, but still need to be refined in order to better reproduce the observed scatter uh, in the mass accretion rate. Because at the moment it's systematically underestimating, uh, overestimating uh, the mass accretion rate in system hosting low mass and high mass white dwarf. And I think I'm running out of time, so I will leave here my summary. And thanks for your attention. And Stephen and I are ready to take uh, questions. Thank you very much uh, for these nice reviews. Uh, questions, please. Laura. Hi, great talk. Um, I am interested in what, so if these things merge, if the low mass white dwarfs merge with their companions, 
if we think we might actually be able to observe these merger events and what you think they might look like. I, I guess this is a question for me, right? Yes. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I think that's that's quite difficult to observe. So uh, in this merge, you basically have that the donor star will just form uh, uh, an extended photosphere around the white dwarf. So basically, this object will look like a like a giant. So uh, I I don't think we can directly observe them and find them uh, as I, I don't think we have observational techniques now for the moment to find them, but anyone can contradict me. What about them looking like slow novi? So my thought is that this in, this consequential angle, angular momentum loss should actually look like a slow nova, and maybe some fraction of slow novi should result in mergers. What do you think about that? Uh, well, um, I, I have no idea about that. Uh, because I'm not really a Nova expert, so I'm not sure how this would look like, but maybe someone else would like to comment about that. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I can very quickly. Um, I think the event is difficult. This is a good idea, but I think it's still difficult to, to, uh, to see. Uh, what I think we can test is if the low mass single white dwarf population that emerges from this resulting giants, if this is in agreement with observations, and it seems to be. So this is kind mm -hmm. of the evidence we have. Um, next question, Dan. Thanks. Uh, uh, this uh, ECAM mechanism, uh, I, I may have missed it. What is, what is its essence? How does it work? Uh, well, so, um... So for the moment, it's called empirical consequential angular momentum loss because uh, has been tailored on the observed mass uh, distribution. Uh, so we don't know yet the origin of this mechanism. One possibility are um, classical nova eruption, so that uh, you get the, the shell of ejected material and the, you have the donor star uh, moving within uh, this shell, and then you have friction, and that would remove angular momentum from the system. And since um, uh, NOVA uh, eruption in, uh, um, in Seville, also low mass white dwarf, have um, a lower expansion velocity, then this mechanism would be more uh, efficient for the system as, um, uh, as the kind of mechanism that, uh, that we need to, to bring in, into agreement the theory with the observation. But the observational constraints uh, are uh, still uh, too few. To, to be conclusive about this possibility. Thanks. Okay, maybe one last question, Wolfgang. Wolfgang? Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, my microphone had issues. Uh, thank you very much for a really nice talk uh, to, bo to both of you. Um, one one quick comment. Uh, you have been lied to. There is no best fit. There is more likely parameters and less likely parameters. And I think one of the nice things you've done is you've shown that there's a degeneracy between log G and, and TAF. And that's just a normal, very normal thing. And that's nothing, I think, to be concerned about. My question was uh, more observational. Is like why, and you probably mentioned this, why are you, are you going to the UV to get these parameters? Is it because of, of they're much brighter there? Or is there is there additional lines there that are interesting? to measure your um, uh, parameters. Uh, sorry, Wolf, I didn't get the, the first part of the comment, but I will uh, answer your question. Uh, I mean, no, no, like, I think the degeneracy you found is, is perfectly reasonable. You were sort of worried about this uh, and I think like, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the, the degeneracy, it's it's normal that, that we have with white dwarf. I just pointed it out. Maybe there are no experts in the public that never meant, uh, had to deal with uh, spectral fitting. Um, yeah, so uh, I go to the ultraviolet because there uh, the white dwarf is the, the dominant source uh, of emission in, in the system oh, because uh, yeah, the optical uh, is dominated by the disc, the near infrared by the donor, but the ultraviolet should be dominated by the emission from the white dwarf. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are more questions, so please ask these questions in uh, also questions to Stephen. Um, uh, in the Slack. 
I think we better move to the next talk. Uh, thanks again to Stephen and Anna for the nice talks.